Okay, there's a lot of topics that I want to cover in church history and truth claims and all that stuff, but I really want you guys to know where I am coming from, and so I want to do a quick about me. I was born and raised in the church. I had two brothers, and they were kind of wishy-washy in the church, but I was always rock solid. Like, I was the kid that everybody said, oh my gosh, like, Carly was born with a testimony. Like, she is just going to be rock solid her whole life. And I really was. Like, since I was 10 years old, my whole plan was to go on a mission. And at that time, I had to wait till I was 21. Like, that was my whole plan. Like, I'm not going to get married young. I'm going to wait to go on a mission. I know that's what I'm supposed to do. I want to serve God, serve a mission. When I was 16, my parents got divorced. And my young women leaders were really, really, really important to me at that time. They were just so amazing and so loving and so helpful. And it really helped me stay even stronger and closer to the church. So since my whole plan, my whole life was to go on a mission, right after high school, maybe even before I even graduated from high school, I started going to institute. And there we had three sets of missionaries, elders, sisters, and Chinese. And I would go out with these missionaries all the time, like all the time. I was their trio. Like I would teach with them multiple times a week. I would pick up investigators for church all the time. Like I was a missionary before I was a missionary. And then during my first year of college, the age change happened. So I was able to go on a mission pretty quickly. And I had to get a visa because I was called to Brazil, but my visa did not come in time. So I ended up having to serve just for a few weeks in the Montana Billings mission. And for just the six weeks that I was in that mission, I was just, I was living my dream. Like this is what I had planned for my whole life. Our mission president loved us. Like us missionaries, we were loved and respected and trusted to do God's work and to follow the spirit and to teach with the spirit and to do what we needed to do as missionaries. And then my visa came. And for the past 10 years, my biggest regret has been getting on that plane and flying to Brazil because the Brazil Curitiba mission was the most depressing, soul agonizing, devoid of the spirit, manipulative, cultish environment that I have ever experienced. So when I got to Brazil, my mission president had only just got there a few weeks before I did. He was brand new. So immediately he called a mission conference and he called everybody together. And he's like, listen, all of you lack faith. You're all faithless servants. He shamed everybody for being part of the lowest baptizing mission in Brazil. Mind you, Curitiba is very far south in Brazil, and it's not like the rest of Brazil, like everybody is Catholic and just loves God and it's easy to baptize. It's a very European culture and more stingy, but because we all lacked faith and we weren't baptizing as much as other Brazilian missions, he forced us all to read Ether 12 every day for our personal study for the entire transfer. And after we would read Ether 12 for our personal study, he said, nobody is allowed to have language study or the 12 weeks, like new missionary training, all those extra studies that, especially like new missionaries we were supposed to have so that we could like actually study Portuguese and know how to talk to people, he took it all away because it was wasting time knocking doors. He's like, just get out of the house at exactly 10 o'clock and just go knock doors. You have to baptize people. He set the precedent that we should be meeting people, taking them to church one Sunday, teaching them all of the lessons within the next week. And by the second Sunday, they should be getting baptized. It was a standard he set and all of the zone leaders, you know, they got on board. Like it was really like a cult environment because he was shame, 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 shame. You're horrible, but also kind of, I love you and you have to do this for God. So of course, like we kind of were on board because we're like, I guess we're here. Like we're missionaries. I guess this is what we're supposed to do. And after that, the mission president really just didn't care if they came back to church. He actually told us in a mission conference, you know what? Everybody has to get baptized either in this life or in the next life. So just baptize them now. It doesn't matter if they continue to go to church, really, after they're baptized, they're not your problem anymore as missionaries, they're the ward's problem. So if the ward wants to reactivate them, the ward needs to be going after them, it's not your problem. So because my mission president had set the standard that everybody should be baptized within two weeks, he made sure that all of the mission leadership would support that. All of the district leaders, all of the zone leaders, he made sure that they were really on board. And he held them accountable and they held us accountable. At one point, he designated some sister training leaders. But of course, anybody called to these leadership roles had to be the highest baptizing missionaries. So the girl that he called as a sister training leader had really high baptism numbers. And it turns out she was in really poor areas. And we all found out that she would trade poor people baptisms for things like microwaves. Yes, she said, hey, if you come get baptized in my church, I will give you and your poor family a microwave. And she did. And this is the kind of behavior that was applauded. And she was our sister training leader as if we were supposed to follow her example. We were also always required to have some investigator to walk to church with us. Like we should never go to church alone. We should always be going with an investigator. But at one time in my mission, like we were divinely led to this one house. We'd knocked on this house many times before. I felt like we should go there again. It was really close to our house, which is close to the church. Um, but we knocked on the house again and this lady comes out crying. She didn't say a word. She's just bawling, opens the gate, lets us in, ends up telling us like, oh my gosh, I was born and raised in the church. I haven't gone in so many years. Like my husband's in jail and all this stuff. Like, I know that this is a sign. I know I need to come back to church. She had these little kids. And so that Sunday we walked with her and her little kids to church. And she really was like divinely put in our paths. Like she really, until this day is still a strong member. Like we reactivated her, you know, miracle, right?
No, we were chastised for walking to church with a member. Even though she hadn't been active for like 10 years, she was a member and it was our job to just walk to church with investigators. And we were chastised, like literally yelled at, like do not walk with her to church again. You need to find somebody to baptize. And that's something that haunted me my entire mission is the disconnect between what the spirit would tell me to do and what my mission leaders would tell me to do. There are so many times when I felt like the spirit was telling me to go do something, but I would be so fearful because I'm like, that's against mission rules. We have so many crazy, crazy rules that I can't even get into. But so often the spirit would be trying to lead me and I would be too scared to follow it because it was against mission rules. Anyways, the baptisms got so bad that a 70 came to our mission and chastised us all. He yelled at us to stop baptizing people and that we needed to go reactivate them. And our mission president was so mad. So here are some of the crazy weird mission rules that we had that like we were really, really held to, but I'm gonna explain some of the worst ones. Our mission president was so adamant about us not wasting the Lord's time. Like I already said, he erased all of our study time. We had one hour of personal study and one hour of companion study, and that was it. He said, the white handbook says the proselyting should start at 10 a.m. So you need to be out of the house at exactly 10 a.m. At a mission conference, he played about a 10 minute scene of the passion of the Christ for us. The whole scene where Christ is dragged up to the cross and nailed brutally to the cross, blood gushing everywhere. We all watched that. And at the end of the clip, he turned on the lights, he walked up to his little podium, and smugly he just goes, that's what Jesus did for you. And you are his missionaries now. Are you gonna be slothful servants? Are you really gonna leave the house at 10.01? Are you going to disgrace God? Are you going to disgrace Jesus Christ who's on your missionary tag? Are you going to waste his time? Or are you gonna get out of the house at exactly 10 o'clock? Because if you don't, if you leave the house at 10.01 or 10.02, you are not worthy to have the spirit that day. So we all lived in fear all morning, our, our one hour of study really turned into maybe like 45 minutes. We had to rush it all because we had to quickly do our personal study, quickly do our companion study. Heaven forbid we had to pee or something before we left the house at exactly 10 o'clock because if we didn't, we were not worthy to have the spirit. So we really spent the majority of our mission like sulking, begging for forgiveness, walking down the street, like, please God, forgive me for leaving the house at 10.05. Like, please give me the spirit. Please guide me. Please make me worthy. Lunch hours were strictly one hour or two. They even told us, if you get to your lunch appointment at 12 o'clock and lunch is not ready yet, you need to leave. Don't talk to the members. Don't talk to people. Even if our investigators were like wanting to, to get to know us and whatever, like we weren't allowed to talk, chit chat, get to know people. We were in and out. We were also not allowed to listen to music ever, except for on P-Day, during P-Day hours and only Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Of course, this is a weird rule that came up in the middle of the mission, and it's not like we all just like had Motab CDs or something. Like most of us just didn't have access to music ever. So all those draining days, all those days where you could just really use like a worship song or a hymn to lift you up, we weren't allowed to listen to any music, not even church music. It was utterly depressing and isolating. But then he told us, you're the best, and we believed him. This kind of pressure really created some bad situations in our mission. Tons of people got baptized that really had no business being baptized at all. At one point, my companion and I, we baptized this totally sketchy guy who soon after his baptism, the church building got robbed. All of the computers were stolen and the guy disappeared. In a different area, there's this totally poor family. It's literally just this druggy mom and the community had built this tiny little shack for her and her like 13 kids that just ran in the street all day and random people fed them. Like they were just kids who, we, they'd come to church with missionaries sometimes just because it was something to do. Their mom wasn't taking care of them. Of course, the district leaders heard about this and they're like, oh my gosh, those kids have been to church. Let's baptize them. Well, one of them ended up being six years old, but we didn't really know that because the druggy mom thought that she was eight. And because we were just supposed to baptize her quick, nobody really checked the dates on anything. It was all just in and out, dunker, she's good. It just became a problem later when the church headquarters contacted our office and they were asking why this baptismal form had a date that indicated that the person that was baptized was only six years old. But my mission president wasn't really worried. We would be blessed for our great efforts. We did what we were supposed to do. However, when I finally came home after my year and a half and I was out of this environment, I finally started to deconstruct and I was just so remorseful and horrified thinking about the things that I had done. I repented for two years for doing what I was told on my mission. And I think that really is where my faith journey started 10 years ago is repenting from doing what I was told on my mission and committing to God that I would only obey him. It was clear to me that church leaders can be completely corrupted, that anyone in a leadership position isn't just called of God. They're not always following the spirit. And although missionaries are told to be exactly obedient, we should really just be exactly obedient to the spirit of what God is telling us. Not what some mission president or some church leader is telling us, but the spirit. So for the last few years, while the prophet and all these church leaders were telling us to do one thing, the spirit was telling me to do another, and I knew who to follow.